So when I think about facial expressions, the first thing I think about are emojis. Uh, why do you think I think about emojis? Yeah. I think when you can think about design that really works, you think about design that um, communicates right, an idea very quickly, that tells you the whole story of the idea, and that summarizes it in a very simple statement. That's like great design. Uh, and I think uh, emojis do a good job of that. You know, Apple is obviously like supreme when it comes to design. Uh, and when you think about like emojis, you think about three main aspects on the face. What are they? Eyes. Eyes. Mouth. Brows. Mm -hmm. Mouth. Your nose is pretty much irrelevant, right? No one can care about whether or not your nose is there. Um, so those things always correspond to set the stage for how emotions actually create interaction with the viewer, right? So when you're talking about emotions, I also like to look at little babies, right? Because babies' facial expressions are almost exaggerated because their proportions are shifted, right? The eyes are significantly larger. The nose is this dainty little thing that kind of stays out of the way. And really, it's all about their mouths. Sometimes they're not, I would say most of the time, they're not even aware of their expressions, but they have a vast amount of like musculature that is shifting their facial relationships in uh, quite a dramatic way. But it also makes it a little bit hard sometimes when looking at a baby because if you're looking at the muscle structure, the muscles aren't as tangential, right? They're not as like structured yet. So you can see where the muscles around the cheek are starting and where the eyebrows are starting, but they're not necessarily like completely defined. So, but they are great in terms of like studying, okay? And I would have to say like, I think this is gonna be an art history lesson too, because like expressions are not something that is modern, like invention by any means. This is a, a painting by um, Bruggen, if you are, uh, Bruggen, if you're, uh, what's the, uh, Norwegian? No, um, Dutch. Uh, and he did this painting of Democritus, and I think a lot of it is about the connection between hands, right, and the relationship to a face. Huh. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, and when we talk about the hands and the facial structure, I think there's a lot of warping that's been happening because he was, like, focusing so much on the detail, right? The eyes aren't completely lined up. This eye is, like, going this way, and this eye is going this way, which is kind of crazy to me. But you'll see a lot of that stuff happen in the Renaissance. It's not anything new. Uh, Sideshow, sorry. All right, so when we look at these things, what I want you to pay attention to are a couple of specific forms, right? The first one is the depth of value that happens in the eye sockets, right? Second thing is the arc of the eyelids because it's extremely important in delineating what's happening on the face. The third thing is the repetition of the arc in the cheeks and the repetition of that arc in the mouth, right? When you have facial expressions actually conducting themselves on the face, right, when they're going through their movements, you're gonna see that the movements tend to repeat because the muscles are somewhat connected from the top to the bottom of the face. Even though they're separated from side to side, you know there's some people that can wink one eye or not the other and henceforth. The emotions tend to be like this psychosomatic kind of like uh, unconscious relationship to how we are thinking and they kind of display on the face um, kind of systematically across, across both sides of the face. Uh, Rembrandt has this really great one where he did a study of his face, but it's very, very subtle. This portrait was sold to the Getty. I think, did I write this down here? Yeah. Uh, for $25.1 million in October of 2013. But what I want you to pay attention to is look at the size. It's smaller than a sheet of paper, right? Painted on copper. He did this study of himself in his 20s. Uh, but what is beautiful about it is that it is very... Uh, sensitive to actual muscle anatomy, but really what his focus is on is on the troughs, right? The depths of the planes that we have been talking about. He shifts the planes around, these value relationships, to kind of indicate the spatial uh, shifts that are happening within the face. So the mouth has like a slight gap in it, right? The opening of the eyes gets a little bit larger. The other thing that he does, which I think is super important, is he pushes like the upper eyelid into the face, right? And he knows that he can barely, like, you know that smile is like in pain right now. 
he's barely holding on to that smile. So it's got this like grimace on the bottom of the lip because the bottom of the lip isn't following the action on the top of the lip, okay? So we're gonna talk about a lot of these contexts. But he also did these studies of himself in copper. You can tell he's the old fugly man right here, right? A little bit older right here. Here he's the younger one. This is the famous one that everyone knows. And then here he's like middle-aged, okay? Uh, so he had this infatuation with facial expressions for a very specific reason. He was trying to create portraits that were very intimate, right? Portraits that displayed a sense of humanity. He was one of the first people that really elevated the notion that he could use subject matter that was like, sometimes it was his neighbor, sometimes it was a whore, sometimes it was his wife. But he really wanted to make these paintings very personal when he was making these biblical uh, images that he's like so well, well known for. Everyone okay? Okay. Uh, one of my favorites uh, in terms of like his study of expressions is Messerschmitt, right? Uh, Messerschmitt uh, was around in the 16th century. Uh, German Austrian sculptor, and I think the interesting thing about his sculptures and his obsession with facial expressions was that it was because of his uh, Crohn's disease, right? He was in a lot of pain, right? All of a sudden, like he found himself in a situation later in life where all he felt was like stomach pain constantly. So in order to like take himself away from his discomfort, he began creating like images of his discomfort in marble, which is extremely hard to do and extremely painful, but also extremely medita meditative. Really? Where? The they had a measurement there? The middle one, yeah. This one? Mm -hmm. I think I remember seeing that one. They've had it for like 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I went like two years ago and I'm like, oh yeah, that's the one that I showed my slides. Yeah. But it's by itself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, there are like numerous studies that have been made. They've brought these sculptures together. How many were there? I forget. I don't know. There were like 64, right? They brought these sculptures together once or twice over the years, but they're really hard to like gather. But there are all these studies of them uh, by other artists who were like infatuated with what he'd created, where they actually go in and study them for the sake of understanding gestures and human expression. So it is one of the few. But Norman Rockwell and American illustrators did a great job of bringing like expressions back to the forefront, right? Because when you were painting or creating illustrations that in photography was still not taken off, uh, they knew that painting had to communicate to a viewer and Rockwell was one of the ones that did this at the top of his game. This is a great illustration of um, uh, this notion of the gossips. He actually entitled it from 1948. I'm going to just read this so that we all know what it's about. Some say the painting was Rockwell's revenge on a woman in Arlington, Vermont, who spread an ugly rumor about him. He recreated the life of the rumor beginning with an elderly woman, right, right here. Uh, whispering about Rockwell to a neighbor from there, the tale takes wing, speeding through town from one eager gossip to the next, until it comes back to Rockwell, who confronts the originator in the bottom, right? So this is actually Norman Rockwell's self-portrait right here, okay? What I think is also uh, amazing is the sensitivity that Rockwell has to uh, likeness and to expression. He's one of the first to really, like, utilize, well, not one of the first, but one of the earliest to really utilize photographs as a way to kind of like illuminate um, painting. So he was always doing this from photographic reference. But if you just take like, for instance, this expression of the woman in the bandana, where she looks not only like surprised, but curious, but also kind of like enthralled, and then takes it and kind of shifts it to one of anger and can you believe this, right? You can actually hear the conversation that's happening in uh, in the paintings, but the beautiful thing is Rockwell takes his what would be otherwise traditional paintings and he begins to exaggerate some of the forms. He takes the eyelids and he pushes them out, or the eyebrows, sorry, right? He takes the mouth and purses it, like pushes it back even more, shifts the expression of the jawline and kind of like stresses some of the values just a little bit, just to kind of create a little bit more contrast. So in making things a little bit darker or in emphasizing like a value, he would be emphasizing the structure of those expressions a little bit more, right? You could tell he's almost exaggerating the eyes in this front view facing one and takes her and begins to do the same with the eyebrow and this eye. It's just a little bit larger than it actually should be or it actually would be in normal life. And then, you know, he really exfoliates uh, a, a, his own face and takes his hat. And what does he do with the hat? He like tilts it down right, to almost mimic the action that's happening in the brow line. 
So even things that you'd normally see in animation, he's doing it in something that's more figurative and more realistic, okay? You Ting, can you get off your phone? Matt, can you tap her? Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, I love this portrait where he uh, has a no swimming sign and these three boys, and even the, and the expression on the dog that he kind of illuminates right here. Right, he even takes the dog and kind of like involves him in the piece. And it's almost like an animated character of the dog, right? So, uh, things to pay attention to uh, always when you're looking at a painting is why are the artists making the choices that they're making? And I think uh, this is one of his most famous ones, the Thanksgiving painting that was posted everywhere. It was actually commissioned by the U.S. government, by Roosevelt himself, because uh, Rockwell was so important at the time. And when he painted this painting, there was no, like, I mean, besides the fact that everyone's white as white could be, all right, there was no, uh, um, there was a lot of consideration taken into how to create, um, I guess, stability in the household, especially during a time of war, right? And he introduces the viewer through just the eyes of this forward-facing character and then pulls them in, right, and moves them through the action by shifting not only their expressions, but by also shifting the direction of the portrait so that the viewer continues to move towards the center of the image, which is this turkey, which at the time was a symbol of like, you know, unity and strength and thanks because they had just survived such an important uh, moment in history, okay? JC Leindecker does the same thing. And I think I, I really appreciate Leindecker's line work because he's painting like a draftsman. And so I would always say to my students, go study this guy. Because in the way that he's kind of creating the brush strokes, he's also emulating the lines that you would technically draw on the surface. But he's emphasizing the structure also through anatomical landmarks. So, you know, I always say Leindecker is a great designer. I showed you that picture of the boy's hair and it was so exaggerated, but he does the same thing with eyebrows, right? He pushes the eyebrows down, makes straight lines when he needs to to create emphasis, designs things like hair into very specific shapes to kind of evoke a sense of form and pushes like axis, uh, axes, right? And counterbalancing lines and all these things that we've been discussing before as a way to kind of like um, emphasize, right? Really beautiful design and painting. It's very hard to recreate and very few people I've seen do it as well as American illustrators. And they don't really get their, their kudos because it's, it's called illustration, it's not card, called painting, but I think they're just as amazing as some of the painters that we kind of um, elevate. Uh, even this portrait of this woman, it's almost abstract if you look at things like the brow, right? The way that he's breaking down the nose, this black little emblem that is the eyeball, and then the shape that he brings in for the face. He really understands shape design for the portrait. Are you all right, Cindy? And she really shifts around those relationships to kind of like elevate those forms and those expressions, okay? So it's not about quantity, it's not about rendering, it's about the emphasis of the form and the emphasis of the structure and really designing it to like kind of elevate those necessary components, okay? Does that make sense to everyone? All right. So uh, I always come back to animation because I think animation is the crux of facial expressions, uh, facial muscle, facial, facial muscles, say that three times fast, and expressions, right? Uh, Russell is a great example of this. He's this pudgy little circle, right? But they can take this pudgy little circle and they can manipulate how his mouth position moves around in order to create really expressive forms, even though they make his eyes very, very tiny. And you'll notice like when he gets excited, they actually have expression movements that they can build into the character to exaggerate some of those shapes right? And to like really um, exhaust like the, the aspect of how they can push and pull some of the expression, expressive motifs. But what I want you to pay attention to is it's always about two things when you think about expressions. It's always about the mouth. And I would say it's not even about the eye. It's about how the brows and the eyes together interact as one relationship to kind of like emphasize what's happening on the surface of the form. So when you're looking at like a face or even your face in the mirror, what I want you to pay attention to is how you can't isolate things like eyes and brows, right? How it's really hard to not have your um, nose move when you begin to pinch the structure. All right, when you begin to pinch the structure of your face, uh, and all these things have to happen in relationship to each other. Okay, this is a great illustration of Damon Wayans. I forget the movie that this is from. It's a pretty popular movie. Anyone know? What was it? Yeah, there you go. Big Hero Six. 
I just watched it too, like six months ago, the kids. Uh, and they were using him as a way to kind of like emphasize the characters and the characters' uh, traits, okay? And this is a common practice. Uh, even if you see like early vo versions of the first Toy Story, they were um, taking snippets of Tom Hanks' expression because Tom Hanks is amazing when it comes to expressions and using that to kind of like move into how they were gonna animate Woody. All right, so let's talk a little bit about muscles. Anyone have any questions so far? All right, so we're gonna break down muscles into their categories, I think it's important to know. I don't expect you guys to memorize these muscles, they're a little bit complicated, I don't even remember them all the time. But what I do want you to understand is visually how they sit on the face, okay? And you're gonna notice their hierarchy kind of conforms to the hierarchy of planes. Uh, we're gonna start with the frontalis muscle. And you can see like what plane is it following? The frontal plane, right? <laughs> it literally actually is following that same muscle group. And you'll see it has like a little division right here, which is sometimes why you'll see individuals have these little creases in between their, their nose like me, right? This muscle is your forehead muscle, right? It's the wrinkly one. And you can kind of shift one separate from the other if you have enough control over it. But you can see the symbiotic relationship that it has with your orbicularis oculi, or the muscle that actually controls the contraction of the eye. In looking at this, what do you think this muscle controls? Controls your blinks. What else? Controls your eyebrow, right? What else? It will pull up your cheek, okay? So when I say, hey, you can't isolate these things, look at the, uh, the amount of land mass this takes on your face right around your eyes, right? All these things are connected into that circumvention or that cir circular pattern of that muscle group. And you can actually see that when the muscle begins to contract or expand, it is shifting all these relationships together. So when we are drawing the planes of the eye, I'm also thinking and teaching myself about how the muscles of the eye begin to shift down or up in relationship to those planes. Yes. It's not pulling back so much as pulling up, right? Uh, it's really hard to pull back because it's like on a flat surface, but I would say it is pulling back at a very, very long, like small range, right? Yeah, when you really think pull back, you think it's kind of like moving back along the axis of the eye. But like I had to have stitches on my eye once and you could see the doctor was pulling up the eyelid because the muscle wants to move up, but as it's moving up, it's moving around the eyeball, right? The eyeball is actually what's creating that circumference. That's why it's, you feel like it's moving back, but it's actually the eyeball protruding that's creating that movement up and down. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. Basically, if I didn't have a circle eyeball right here, right, your eyelid would just go up and down. But because my eyeball is sticking out, when that muscle is pulling up, right, it feels like it's tucking into that crevice. Does that make more sense? Yeah, I just okay. thought Yeah, when it's opening, it's just kind of like moving along the axis of the slit, and it's just kind of this area right through here is doing, this area right through here is doing most of the work, right? We talked about this a little bit when we talked about eye, uh, eyelids, uh, upper and lower. Which one's doing most of the movement? Upper, right? Your lower eyelid, you can actually see, I mean, I can see, I will, we'll talk about it. When you look at the muscle groups, right, there's a lot more striations happening at the top, right? and they're much closer at the bottom, they don't have as much flexibility at the bottom, right? So they have a lot more movement towards the top and they tuck inside this little ridge right here, okay? They're almost flat right here on this lower side. What you get is a lot of pinching and a lot of pulling at these axis points. And that's also because of how they connect to the other muscles. So the frontalis and the orbicularis are working together right here, okay? And that's why you actually don't have too much movement right here on the side because the temporalis muscle is actually pretty flat and doesn't have too much relationship, unless you're trying to pull up your ear, which some people can do, right? You can kind of like, I don't know, I can't do it, but twiggle your ears. All right, down from there, you have your zygomaticus major, minor and major, which obviously is a pretty easy uh, muscle to remember, because what is it running along? Your zygomatic bone, right? Uh, it kind of doesn't do too much, right? It just runs along the axis of your masseter, comes all the way down, and what do you think it helps you do? 
Helps your mouth, right? Helps your mouth kind of move up and down a little bit. Sometimes it'll help you breathe. Like you can actually open your nostrils based on the zy zygomaticus. But it's not what we would call like a functional drawing muscle too much. But some people will have little indentations right here. And that is the separation of the orbicularis oris, which is this muscle right down here, right? Which goes all the way around and circumvents the mouth. And that is the, uh, what do we call that? What was it? Yes, the muzzle of the mouth. Thank you. I was thinking orbit. Uh, that is really what kind of lays over the muzzle of the mouth, the orbicularis. And when you think about it, it's like, okay, the orbit of the oris, which is the mouth, the orbit of the oculi, which is the eye, they kind of make sense in terms of how they've actually been named. Okay? The naming conventions are pretty simple. What I want you to pay attention to, though, is how the shapes kind of conform to what? If I smile, what's going to happen? You're going to have a crease, and that crease is because the orbicularis oris is pushing up against the zygomaticus and also the platysma, and there's also one other muscle right here, which is not right here, which is the masseter muscle right there, okay? So it's where these muscles actually connect, where we begin to see simultaneously planimetric relationships of shifting, right? And also indentations in the muscle groups. We always talked about this. What's dictating the shapes of the head? Your bones right? If you look at the muscles, look how closely they line up to the shapes of those bones, right? They actually fall into specific categories where those muscles actually happen, okay? So those are the big ones. I don't want you to think about anything else. Uh, if you can think about the frontalis, if you think about the orbicularis oris and the orbicularis uh, oculi, those are the two big ones. The last one is the masseter. The masseter is actually helping your jaw move up and down, right? It's kind of like the rubber band that helps you talk and connect. If I was to stick my hand in uh, Kermit's mouth, it's kind of the puppet action that's happening to like make that mouth hinge back and forth. There's a whole bunch of other ones like the, uh, I think the name has changed. No, it's the platysma right here and then the risorius right there, which actually help you to kind of move your jaw. And it's gonna be that muscle that kind of connects from the masseter all the way down to your neck. But we only kind of focus on the sternocleidomastoid. The platysma is the one that makes that front of the circumference of your jawline. Okay. So that comes from here and goes over? Yeah. Down yeah, you can actually feel it as I'm moving my jaw up and down. You're going to feel it moving your neck, right? Okay. All right. So those are the big ones. What I want you to do is look at this illustration and kind of think about the action of the muscles, right? If I'm thinking about the frontalis muscle, it wants to pull up. If I think about the orbicularis oculi, it wants to pull down, right? If I think about the nasalis, it wants to open up the nasal passages, right? The orbicularis oris is moving in two different directions. One is going around the philtrum, and the other one is pulling down on, along the axis of the form. And it just depends on what position my mouth is in, right? This is like such a major thing in terms of uh, speaking, even. Uh, the masseter is pulling out, right, and up, the masseter is pulling out and up simultaneously. So they are interacting with each other that creates, uh, in a way that creates those actual physical creases that we see on our face, okay? So, once again, when I think about muscles, I'm thinking about action lines, okay? And I wanna make sure that when I'm drawing those action lines in, I'm not just copying what I'm seeing. That's actually the point in time where you can exaggerate a little bit. We saw, uh, Rockwell doing it in illustrations that were taking a lot longer. You can see J.C. Leindecker doing it in illustrations that are pretty simple. And you see it on Russell's face, which are very quick drawings to create facial interactions that we can actually relate to. So the job today is to kind of execute drawings that we can draw in a way that is fast and clear. All right. So the th big thing that I want to kind of like focus on is the understanding that muscles move in ver very specific uh, concentric and linear movements, right? So the muscles around the eye will always move and circumvent around the eye, right? And they'll always want to move out or in. So you either see like major compression or you see major extension, okay? When the orbicularis or I like actually oculi moves, you're going to see compression that actually moves all the way through to the nose right? And you'll see these same repeating, usually like three or four patterns moving into the eye, okay? The problem is if I draw all these lines in, what tends to happen? It's too much, 
right? So you have to think about it like a designer. If I draw everything that I see, it's almost gonna feel like there are railroads, uh, like kind of tracks happening next to the eye. It's gonna feel very awkward and heavy. So what you wanna do is always create emphasis. You're always thinking about the major structures of what you see. It is important to also link muscles together. When I see the furrow of the brow, I'm also gonna tend to see a great deep furrow right where the eyelid actually hits the eye. And these connections are really important because that's what kind of uh, forces the emotions to feel like they're actually existing, right? I wouldn't draw the lines together, but I would definitely like emphasize this value while drawing this line. Because if I map the line, it's a good question. If I map the line, it's actually a really good question. If I map the line from the eyelid, I should have talked about that. If I map the line from the eyelid all the way to the brow, what's gonna happen with my drawing? Yeah, it's gonna feel funny. Uh, how could I describe funny? It will flatten out the actual trough that's actually happening underneath the orbit of the eye and it will make it look like this line and this line are on the same plane, but they're not, right? You know that the furrow that's actually happening right here on my brow is like almost a half an inch farther up than it is with the depth that's actually happening under my orb, um, on, on my eyelid. So if I make a line that maps the two, right, it brings them both in the same plane and it makes it look like a cartoon. It's the easiest way to kind of describe it. So you want them to stay separate. That's why you want to break up that line. Is the reason that we simplify our drawings and we design for it, do we see, do we simplify when we're looking? Is that the reason? You do simplify when you're looking. It's an excellent point. It's actually something I was talking about yesterday in graduate class too. Uh, it, it's one of those things where if you draw everything that you see, you heighten the relationship of how you are seeing it and everything becomes of equal importance, wow. right? And if you think about like good painting or good drawing, we just looked at it in Rembrandt's drawing and painting, right? Everything can't be of equal importance. What's, what's of the most importance are usually the things that have the greatest depth on the surface of the form. So biggest darks, right? That's the easiest way to kind of explain it. So I know that I'm always gonna be drawing like at least one or two furrows on a brow if I'm seeing the brow go up, right? Do I wanna draw all of them? No, I have to pick and choose which ones are gonna be the most significant, right? I wanna always draw the lines that are happening around the cheek. The great thing about the cheek is the compression between the masseter muscle and the muscle of your obicularis right, is just one single muscle line connecting. So you're always going to see that significant muscle. But the muscle transitions, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So when I'm drawing, let's go into the forehead. When I'm drawing the forehead, the most dominant line ends up being the second line up, right? The first line is pushing, and you're going to see it kind of wrap around the orbit of the eyes. And then it begins to dissipate as it goes higher and higher because the tension of those muscles begins to dissipate simultaneously. If I was to draw every single line, it's going to feel awkward. But if I draw these two, then I'm creating emphasis without overemphasizing. Okay? Make sense? Should they be drawn the same value? No. no. Okay? You're also thinking about line quality and line work. All right? If I see the facial, facial muscles that are happening around the nasal bone, for instance, right? Uh, I don't want to recreate every single tangent, but if I look at these values, I know that for sure I have to create this one. You can see the trough right here, right? For sure I have to delineate that one. Maybe if I feel like it, I can delineate this one, but if I draw it like a black line, it's gonna look like he has a zit on his forehead, okay? <laughs> Literally. So how do I want to draw it? I want to indicate it with a subtlety that expresses the fact that there's extra tension there, but not the same tension that's happening around the brows. Make sense? that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is where the nasal, uh, nasalis actually compresses with the orbicularis oculi. Okay, there's like these two major muscles here. I'm not going to go into like all the smaller muscles because it's just not worth it. Uh, this is that, I forget what we call this muscle. Does it, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but if you have dimples, right? It is this set of muscles that actually wraps around and creates an indentation between the muscle groups that creates dimples, but that muscle group actually dictates how low the arc of your mouth is or how high the arc of your mouth will go, right? So when I'm thinking about these muscles, I'm thinking about the relationship of the orbicularis as separate because that is expressing the arc of your smile or your frown, right? And then it's going to pull with it the muscles that are pulling, and that's going to express a different arc 
So I always emphasize the edges of the mouth as a way to kind of delineate where the mouth is in space, right? It kind of is a marker for those spatial relationships. Really important, okay? Uh, just more faces, more pictures. Um, go study them. This guy's got like some really funny ones. <laughs> it's like, this is like, uh, what's his face? Uh, who's the quirky guy? The comedian? The white one? Huh? Not Mr. Bean, the one that was like, anyway, I'll remember later. Um, so, you know, I just, I threw a bunch of emotions in here so you can kind of like start studying like, okay, what does it mean when I'm happy? What does it mean when I'm sad? And you'll start understanding when I'm sad, right? My br brows tend to want to go down, right? My frown will tend to want to go like this, right? My lines will tend to want to emphasize here. You know, you're going to usually see like a crevasse here. If I'm smiling, right, the arc tends to want to push up and out, up and out right? The arc of my mouth is going to go up as well, right? My chin line, those orbicularis lines are going to go up as well. And then these muscles open up. So C curves become a really dominant form, okay? So just something to kind of think about. Here are my tips, okay? These are tips that I've gathered over the years. Uh, I think this is actually like a handout from a husband and wife couple that work at Disney. I'm forgetting their name right now. Uh, asymmetry in facial expressions, right? I think it's extremely important, but it is a symbiotic relationship. Yes, things are asymmetrical, but they're not completely asymmetrical because the muscles have to move in coordination with each other. So one of the things I want to think about is making sure that I have my character in a good place to start. What does that mean? That means my P's, proportion, perspective, and placement needs to be first, right? As soon as I've adapted where those things are, using my center lines, my line of action, and my placement for whatever the, my proportions are going to be, then I can think about where that axis exists, and then I can begin to think about how to structure those forms. I always start with the eyes, because for me, that is where I've come from in my past. That's where animation kind of like holds its form. That's what we used to draw more than anything. And I always want to remember that brow muscles move in relationship with the muscles of the eyes. So it's like drawing a mask. We used to say that a lot, and I still say that around the eyes and thinking about the top of the mask as the brow and thinking about the inside of the mask as the slits of the, the mask shape, right? Or the eyes. So if I'm like piercing at somebody, right? Everything is gonna compress. If I'm really open, everything's gonna open up. If I'm like pinching at my nose, everything is gonna move towards that center. And I wanna always be attentive to those relationships, right? But slightly having them askew is really, really important. I don't wanna draw one side identical to the other because they're not gonna work the same way because your, mu your muscles have different interactions. And you're gonna be left or right dominant. Whoever you're looking at, everyone's gonna have one side of dominance, okay? Uh, when you're thinking about a mouth, always think about the sides, right? They're never going to be even. Those muscles interact uh, in a very unequilateral way, even though they're simultaneously moving. So think about the size that you're trying to emphasize based on the expression that's happening on the viewer, uh, on the model. If you look at all these expressions, you're going to see exactly what I'm saying. This is the light side. This is the heavy side, right? Which side would you say is the dominant side on this one? Is it going to be left or right? Hmm? Left. left, right? You can actually see it. If you look at the value of the muscle, it's much deeper here. The trough is much deeper. This is a slightly tapered side. Look at the angle. The angle here is almost like a left angle, a uh, 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 90 degree angle. The angle on the right is more of a C curve, okay? Yes, those muscles are doing the same thing, but they're not happening simultaneously, exactly the similar, right? When you have this level, so your shot don't fall asleep. When you have this level of detail, I was doing it yesterday, don't worry. Uh, when you have this attention to detail in your drawings, your drawings are going to start to elevate because you're going to be more attentive to the individual's actions on the form. Also, okay. don't look at yourself after. Don't look at yourself. Just don't look at the mirror. <laughs> uh, match the eyebrows to the shape. This is something that I use for my animators a lot, uh, for people that are thinking about storyboarding a lot. But you're not going to necessarily match them to shape when you're drawing from a figure, but you do want to keep that correlation in the back of your mind. If my eyes are going to be open, the arc is going to similarly repeat in the brow. If my eye is going to be closed or tweaking, the arc in the brow is going to move in that same direction. Using lines versus curves is a really important thing to kind of extend into your motivation as a drawing. Okay? Does anyone have...